praise God. Thank you for um, supporting the Life Trip. Those of you who supported it, and of course, our youth ministry team. Grateful for the difference that you make in the lives of our teenagers. Hey, I don't ask you to do this often, but I want, I want, as I'm preaching this morning, would you consider just praying for me for a little bit as I preach? Because this message is intense. All right, so if you could pray for me, that would be awesome. We are near the end of this series. Uh, next week will be the final installment of We Are Family. We Are Family. Here's where we've been over the course of the last several weeks. We've talked about this is what we do as a church family, and this is what we believe. So here are some things that we do. We are a church of small groups. We are a church that serves one another on ministry teams. We pray for healing. We've done a lot of that recently. We have several people in our church who are in need of physical healing, emotional healing. Uh, we're a church that supports global missions. I love what Seth talked about, that he feels the call to be a missionary. Praise God for that, because we want to support that. And we are a church that supports local outreach. Oh, and by the way, starting today, we are a church that puts drinks in our cup holders. How about that? You got some cup holders on your seat backs. You can go ahead and put your coffee if you, by chance, put your coffee on the ground and you kick it over, there will be a $10,000 fine for those of you who do not use our cup holders. So that's what we do. Um, and, and here's what we've been talking about in terms of what we believe. We believe that the Old and New Testaments are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And then last week we said that Jesus Christ is the true God and the true man. Now today, the reason I said this is intense is because uh, we're going to get into it today, all right? Here's what we're talking about. The second coming of Jesus Christ is imminent, meaning it's coming. It's personal, meaning we will see him physically return, and it will be visible, meaning everybody's going to see it. Amen? And that's what we just sang about. I loved our time of worship where we talked about the fact that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and no matter what trials you're experiencing, and no matter how bad it gets, because it's, it's going to get worse, we'll talk about that in a minute, he's with us, and he loves us, and he's going to come back and make everything right. So let's get into it. We're just going to jump straight into this. This is Matthew 24. One day, Jesus left the temple, and he was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call attention to all of its buildings. So they're leaving the, the temple in Jerusalem, which looked like this. And Mark's gospel, which gives us a parallel account, says that one of his disciples said, look, teacher, what massive stones... What magnificent buildings. Like, this was an incredible structure. Most historians say that this is one of the most impressive buildings in the ancient world. Look how amazing it is. Look, you can see the gold glistening in the distance. History tells us that it took 18,000 men 80 years to build the temple. Some stones measured 40 feet by 12 feet by 12 feet and weighed 800,000 Pounds. So from one end of this stage to the other is 40 feet, if you can believe it. 12 feet up, that was one of the stones. It, it was an ancient marvel to be able to, to build those and to move them, which makes Jesus' next statement astounding because he looks at his disciples and he says, you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down and they're like, yeah, but they weigh like eight hundred thousand pounds. How how are people going to throw them down? Well, when you study the history of the nation of Israel, forty years after this prediction, we talked about this two weeks ago. Forty years after Jesus predicted this, the Roman general Titus had a massive legion of Roman warriors. They surrounded the wall of Jerusalem. And they didn't let anyone leave, and they didn't let anybody come inside the city wall. There was famine, starvation, even cannibalism that happened. Eventually, they poked a hole in the wall around Jerusalem, made their way inside, slaughtered thousands, made it to the temple building, that massive building with the massive stones and the gold and the glistening. And in AD 70, the Roman general Titus built large wooden scaffolds around the walls of the temple buildings piled them high with wood and other flammable items, and set them ablaze. The heat from the fires was so intense that the stones crumbled 
The rubble was then sifted to retrieve the melting gold, and the remaining ruins were thrown down into the Kidron Valley, thus fulfilling Jesus' prophecy. And you can visit Israel today. You can visit Jerusalem and see the remains of the stones that had fallen from the temple structure. It's one of the reasons I believe that the Bible is, in fact, reliable. So the disciples hear this. And as is often the case, they're like, that sounds awful, but I'm not exactly sure how this is going to happen and when it's going to happen. So they eventually make their way up to the Mount of Olives, right? And here's how Matthew records it. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. We know through Mark's account that it's James, John, Peter, and Andrew who are with Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives. If you visit Jerusalem today, this is what it looks like from the Mount of Olives. You can see the temple. It's about a mile in the distance. So you think about Jesus being arrested in Gethsemane. He's got to walk about a mile to the temple. Nowadays, we have a Muslim mosque called the Dome of the Rock that sits on the Temple Mount. In Jesus' day, it was the temple glistening in the sun. Massive stones, magnificent buildings. And as Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, they came to him privately, these, these four disciples, and they say, tell us, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? In other words, okay, when's this going to happen? When are the stones going to be toppled in the temple? And when will be the coming of the end of the age? Now, Jesus is going to give what is probably some of the most disputed texts in the entire New Testament. There are more opinions than there should be concerning this passage, okay? And I'm going to take a certain position on this, and here's, here's kind of where I'm going. One scholar by the name of Michael Wilkins says that the Olivet Discourse, in other words, the sayings of Jesus on the Mount of Olives, um, are, are essentially this. Jesus does allude to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Okay, it happens 40 years after his prediction. But he uses these events to foreshadow end times events. In other words, 40 years after Jesus' prediction, the, temples, or the, the Romans destroyed the temple. And that is a picture of end times events. Now, if you have kids at home or you raise little kids you've probably had the following scenario happen, where you're working in one of the rooms, and there's some silence, and you're like, it's a little bit too quiet. And you go and you check after like an hour, and you walk into the kitchen, and it looks like the apocalypse. There's like eggs all over the place, broken eggs. There's like great grandma's Voss, the family heirloom, which is shattered all over the kitchen ground. Your little three-year-old has your phone, you know, egg yolks all over it, trying to dial her friend, and there's just technology and game, all the games got mixed up. I've heard this sort of thing happens. I've never experienced it myself, but, <laughs> and you look at it, and you're like, oh, my word. See, y'all have seen this happen, right? And then the spouse walks into the room, or maybe an older sibling walks into the room, and they're speechless as well, and they're like, and then they say those words. They say, hey, no big deal. It's not the end of the world. And you're like, actually, it is the end of the world, because I don't know what I'm going to tell great grandma. I don't, my phone, like phones are expensive. I got all these games mixed up. I don't know how I'm going to move on from this. This is awful. This is like, it's all over, right? When Jerusalem was destroyed. It was really, really bad. A million Jews were slaughtered. Thousands of Jews flooded the slave markets. It was really, really bad, but it wasn't the end of the world. It was a picture or a foreshadowing of the end times. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, this is what Wilkins says about Matthew chapter 24. He calls it a rough outline. So Jesus does not fill in all of the details about the end times. So if you're someone who has studied the end times before, you may be familiar with terms like the rapture or the four horsemen of the apocalypse or the antichrist, all these sophisticated terms that are associated with the end times. Jesus doesn't talk about any of that. 
Rather, those terms are used by people like John when he writes the book of Revelation. Some of Paul's letters fills in some of those details. Jesus gives us a rough outline of the end times, and he's talking about Jesus' second coming. Right? So, um, in response to the disciples' question about when these sorts of things are going to happen, Here's what he says. And again, stay with me here. This is 70 AD that he's referring to in some of these verses, but he's also referring to the end of the world or the end times. So here's what he says to his disciples. Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. Watch out. Be on your guard. Now, you may have heard of the illustration of people who study currency, and they try to figure out what's counterfeit currency but they never study counterfeit currency. They only study the real thing so that when counterfeit currency shows up, they're able to say, oh, that's counterfeit. And in the same way, I would say, if you're a Jesus follower, we should know Christ. We should know what he taught. We should know what he did so that when a false teaching or a false Messiah shows up, we can say, oh, that's false. That's counterfeit. Then he goes on. You will hear wars and rumors of wars. Now, this is where the sermon's gonna get pretty intense, okay? I did a little bit of research, and depending on which websites you go to, right, these are approximate numbers. You don't have to go very far to discover that there are a few wars happening in the world today, right? Let me, let me just show you a few of the major wars that are going on as we speak. The skulls represent the geography. Mexican drug war, 360,000 people have died since the beginning of the Mexican drug war. The war in Ukraine that's happening right now, 6,000 people have been killed. Syria, the conflict in Syria, 610,000 people have died, and that conflict still goes on. Darfur, Sudan, over 300,000 people have died. The war on terror, which began on 9-11 and continues, has taken over 900,000 lives. Myanmar, also known as Burma, there's a terrible civil war going on today in which 23,000 people have died. Jesus says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. When you see wars, when you hear of rumors of wars, know this, that Jesus predicted it, and he still has the whole world in his hands. He goes on, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. We know that roughly 25,000 people die every day of hunger or hunger-related causes. You know that there are food insecure people even in our local communities. And as Christians, if you're a Christian, we can be part of the solution to that. So we've been talking about, you know, the pantry of angels that serves 800 people every week who are hungry and food insecure. And I just want to say, if you feel called or inspired to help out the Pantry of Angels, you can go to beartownroad.org slash Pantry of Angels. And I just talked to Crystal who said, we're in need of more turkeys. Like not middle school kids, but we're in need of more, sorry, middle school kids. We're in need of more turkeys for Thanksgiving. They need like 100 more turkeys. We will give you more details of how we can provide more turkeys. Here's what Jesus says. Famine and earthquakes and and, uh, wars, they're the beginning of birth pain. Now, I have some experience with birth pains. (laughs) They're pretty painful. I've experienced them four times. And I just want to kind of show you what this looks like, okay? When you're in the the room and and your wife is, is experiencing birth pains, also known as contractions, there's a little monitor off to the side with the little waves on it, right? And and this is what it this is what it goes like. If, if, you're, if you have a spouse who's pregnant, you need to take notes. This is, this is what happens. So she's doing good, and then it's like, oh! And then there's a time of peace. And then it's, oh! And then there's a, time, there's a time of peace, and then, 
Uh, and it's like a roller coaster. And it, I mean, it is painful. It is so hard, right? It's so difficult for the women, but also difficult for the men. <laughs> and uh, I'm done having kids because of that. Like, I'm done. That's it. I don't need any more birth pains. <laughs> so we're in the birth pain period where there's wars and then there's time of peace and there's famine and there's a time of peace. And in those birth pain periods, and Jesus uses this analogy to say that the baby's on its way, right? The coming of Jesus is on its way. He's coming, but right now we're experiencing those contractions is the illustration. He says, during these birth pains, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. And some of you have experienced that ostracization, middle school kids, high school kids, it's difficult, right? Certainly across the world, there's intense persecution going on, but it's going to get worse. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. This verse is huge. This verse is huge. The world's going to get worse. The world is going to get more wicked. And as wickedness increases, the love for Jesus and the love for his people, for some, Jesus says most, will grow cold. So this is the, this is the only question I'm going to ask you today, and it's simply this. As wickedness increases... Will you conform, complain, or stand firm? Those are your three choices. As the world gets worse, as wickedness increases, you could either, I can't beat them, I might as well join them. I might as well be wicked like everybody else. Or you could just complain about it, or you could stand firm. So I want to illustrate this for you. See if my hot coals are done yet. So in this, in this grill, is, these are some hot coals, right? It's been, it's been heating up for a while. And this grill illustrates, for the sake of this illustration, this illustrates the church. And I know some of you are still wrestling with whether or not you want to follow Jesus. But I would say most of the people in this room would say, I want to follow Jesus, and I don't want to be like the person who's going to get cold. I don't want to be lukewarm. I want to be hot. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, stay hot. Stay hot. So here we are, right? We're, we're gathered together. We're gathered together. We are a hot group of Jesus followers. We are the family of God, the family of Christ. And as we stay together, iron sharpens iron, right? Heat feeds off heat. And if somebody gets a little bit cold, you know, gets a little bit cold, we just kind of, we kind of wrap our arms around them, right? And we help them get hot. That's what we do, because we all have moments where we get cold. And most of us are going to have moments where we're called to leave the fold and enter a wicked environment. Now, you got to be used, you got to use wisdom in terms of when you're going to be a part of a wicked environment. Like some of you, you look at your teenagers and you're like, you are never entering a wicked environment. I'm protecting you from that wicked environment, which is a good thing. Some of you need to never go to wicked environments because it's messing you. Uh, but most of us at some point are going to be in a wicked environment. We're going to be at the lunch table in middle school or high school, right? Right? And it's like, <sighs> that conversation is wicked. And you got a choice. Am I going to conform? Am I going to complain? Oh, kids these days, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> or am I going to stand firm? So you, you enter this wicked environment, and we're called to stand firm. And it's even better when you get a couple other hot coals with you who can help you stand firm, right? And then after we are in that wicked environment, it's like, all right, well, let's, let's go back and let's get heated up a little bit more, and maybe we'll bring a couple wicked people with us, and then maybe they'll kind of get consumed a little bit by the heat and after a while, they'll become a hot follower of Jesus. Those are your three choices, right? Are you going to 
Just be like all the other wicked people. Are you going to complain that the world's getting worse? Jesus predicted it. Or are you going to stand firm and seek to be a light? And are you going to be a part of the family of God? What we've been talking about the last few weeks where we come together to sharpen and to help each other stay hot. And then Jesus says this. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Everybody with me so far? So now we're going to talk about the end times. So far, we've been talking about birth pains, contractions, difficulties, wickedness, wars. Now we're talking about the contractions getting closer together, which points to the delivering of the baby or the coming of the Son of Man. Here's what Jesus says. So when do you see the Standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Okay. Now, you got to stay with me for this part. When Jesus says this, he's referring to Daniel, I think it's chapter 9, verse 27. Spoken of through the prophet Daniel, the Daniel who was rescued from the jaws of the lion. And Daniel gives a prophecy that looks like this, and it was given 600 years before Christ. Part of this prophecy was fulfilled in 167 BC. As a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, a general for the Greeks who took over after Alexander the Great passed away, and Antiochus Epiphanes walks into the temple, And he takes a pig, which is non-kosher if you're Jewish, and he sacrifices it on the altar and desecrates the altar or desecrates the holy place. And the Jews are like, that is an abomination. And then a man by the name of Judas Maccabees leads a revolt and kicks Antiochus Epiphanes and the Greeks out of there. They enjoy a time of peace and they rededicate the temple, also known as Hanukkah, right? So Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. Fast forward, here's Jesus with his disciples talking about the de- the, you know, this, this abomination that causes desolation. So the whole Greek thing I just gave you happened 167 years prior. So what does this mean? It could mean 70 AD when the Romans flattened the temple. And because I believe that this is also talking about the future end times, it's also referring to something in the future. I just don't know what that means. And sometimes <laughs> when you read a verse and you don't know what it means, you move on. So we're going to move on. Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of his house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women. I'm sorry, pregnant women. I feel like we're picking on all the pregnant women today. Those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers, pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Again, this is a prophecy that is fulfilled in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple, and it's going to be fulfilled in the end times future. Okay, Jesus goes on. For then there will be great distress, also translated the great tribulation. Now we're starting to talk about the great tribulation, the the contractions that are getting quicker that are pointing to the coming of Jesus, okay? There will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. This is the hard part of the sermon. The great tribulation will be horrific. Nothing in human history will be like the Great Tribulation. Let me give you some examples. The Black Death, 1348 in Europe, killed between 30 and 60% of Europe's population. The Great Tribulation will be worse. The Jewish Holocaust killed 6 million people under Nazi Germany. The Chinese famine, 1958 to 1962, killed 45 million people. 
the killing fields of Cambodia in 1975 to 1979, 2.5 million people killed 21% of the population of Cambodia. In Rwanda, relatively recently, 21%, a million people were killed in 1994 as a result of the genocide. The tsunami in 2004 in the Indian Ocean killed 230,000 people like that. The Great Tribulation, according to Jesus, will be worse than all of that. It will be like this. Pain, no rest. Pain, no rest. Pain, 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 pain. And Jesus says, it's going to be bad, but I just want you Christians to know. I want you Jesus followers to know that if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, which is a term that's used to refer to as Christians, Jesus followers, those days will be shortened. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, to deceive even Christians. Now, here's the best part of the sermon. Okay, so if you're, you know, if you're online looking at something, just, this is awesome. This is so good. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Immediately after the distress or the tribulation of those days, they will see it's visible. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. I just want you to take a minute to think about that moment where the great tribulation is occurring. There's pain, there's death, there's mourning. And then all of the sudden, Jesus says, enough, I'm coming back. And I don't know how this is going to work if it's like the, the sky light, you know, lights up and everybody sees them coming on the clouds, but it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. He goes on, he says, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Anybody here play trumpet? A few of you. My 11-year-old plays trumpet. I love listening to the trumpet most of the time. <laughs> and uh, when I think about the trumpet playing, th this is what I think of. And it gets a little bit louder. Gets up a little bit, right? It's like, oh, here he comes. Here he comes. No, no, no. Let me say this. Do we have any New York Mets fans in the house? We're not Mets fans. If you're a Mets fan, th this is how this works, right? The trumpet starts going, and now all the Mets fans, they got, they got trumpets in the crowd, and the mascot's got a trumpet, and Edwin Diaz comes out from the bullpen, and he's like, oh, here I come. Here I come. And he gets up there, and he's like the dominant closer, right? Almost every time this guy shows up on the mound, lights out, he shuts him down. He is the savior of the Mets most of the time. You look at his stats, right? This guy, this guy has three blown saves this year, which means he almost always ends it. You can end it now, even though we were getting a little excited, even though the Mets fans right there were liking that. He ends it. Now, here's the thing. When Jesus comes back, he's not going to blow it. He's going to end it. Doors are, it's, it's, it's over. I'm, I'm coming back, right? He'll send his angels with a loud trumpet call. They'll gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. And by the way, nobody, nobody knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. So all that to say is this. Wickedness and pain will increase. Jesus will return. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's coming back. 
where he will make everything right. Jesus will return, and you must return next week to find out how it all ends. But suffice to say this for now. Here's how the Apostle Paul t- tells us um, we, we should act. He says this, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Stand firm. Don't grumble. I know, you're, I know you're tempted to grumble about all the wickedness, but don't grumble. Don't grumble and complain or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. The Apostle Paul said this to Timothy, God's solid foundation stands firm. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So you have a choice, right? You got a choice. When wickedness increases and the world gets worse, you could conform, you could complain, or you could stand firm. You could conform. You could complain, or you could stand firm. You could complain, or you could be part of the solution. You could complain, or you could support worldwide missions. You could say, I'm going to get involved in the church where there's some other hot people who are pursuing Christ so that my heart doesn't grow cold, so that my love for the Father doesn't grow cold. I'm going to get around some Jesus followers who who can inspire me in my walk. Because I know wickedness is going to increase, but I'm not going to complain. I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm going to gather together with some Jesus followers in small groups or one-on-ones or church services or youth group or children's church. Because I know the world's going to get worse. And I know the love of most is going to grow cold, but not this heart. Not this heart. Not this attitude. Not this mindset. For I am going to stay hot. And I'm going to wait for my Jesus to return, who's going to make it all right. And I know that he is sovereign, and I know that he still holds the entire world in the palm of his hands. Amen.